The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. I'm a math student at UNC Charlotte, so it's a serious science. Because I really did not like Java that much. So it's a really great language if you work with it. No offense. Just not my cup of tea. Even though I do work on .NET at my internship. So I'm kind of a little bit of a traitor. BSC guy right here is about to kill me. I'll just <laughs> step back a little bit. So um, I've been running uh, Linux for about four years. Um, a friend of mine actually uh, got me into it. And I used Ubuntu, and then I used Arch. And it's actually through Arch that I came across the CD and how um, we handle the booting of services. And so uh, that's what I'll be talking about. And that's a uh, uh, disclaimer. I'm not here to start a holy war, because if you are in any of this known list or an IRC channel, and system income stuff, uh, Equitus have been known to uh, fly back and forth. And war has been known to break out. And one community actually fragmented because of this. And so we had a distribution that could come up and then take system out because they say the developer, so often the developer calls audio, when it's pottery, does not know what he's doing. Which is, you know, so I'm not here to start a holy war. And um, so um, let's kind of begin system D. Uh, here's some basic info. Uh, targets on Linux distributions. Uh, this is because of um, C groups, which are enabled in the Linux kernel by default. And we as C's kernel does not provide that. And uh, system D does require C groups. You can compile your own kernel and not have C groups. So if you don't have C groups, uh, it will not, BS, system D will not run because it needs C groups to manage its services, like the daemon. And then um, it uses aggressive parallelization. And that's been um, one of the big key points of system D. It's actually not the first one to use aggressive parallelization. Launch me a Mac um, uh, product that uh, Apple uses to boot your systems up. Also uses it. And it's a replacement for Sys 5 in it and up or 12. But mainly it's for Sys 5 in it. And uh, it's a Red Hat project. As I said, Atlantic Pottering is a uh, developer for Red Hat in uh, Germany. And um, he came up with the idea, and when I talked to him, he said it was just one to make it better. And uh, he's a really nice guy. And Red Hat's a really cool company to work for, he said. And then uh, UDES 4 Street has been merged in System D. And that's actually because the developer for UDES is a System D developer. So it kind of was only a matter of time for you guys to migrate into it, into the fourth tree. Uh, so what is system D? Uh, one usually goes by this, and in my presentation on system D, I go by it too, because I think it gives the, uh, the best information about system D, and it really conveys what it's trying to do, and uh, how it does it. Uh, system D is a system uh, and session manager for Linux, compatible with Sys5 uh, and LSD Linux scripts, System D provides aggressive parallelization capability, uses um, socket and debug activation for starting services, offers on demand starting a daemon, keeps track of processes using one of the groups, uh, supports snapshotting and restoring the system state. So you can actually, um, if you do want to be RPS, you can snapshot your system state, and also do it with system D. So you don't need to have a particular file system to snapshot, which is really cool, and I'll use it once or twice. And it works as uh, prescribed. Uh, maintains mount and auto mount points. So, system D, uh, since it's been, since you didn't merge into it, it also remembers your auto mount points when you put your USB stick in. System D automatically remembers. And then um, it implements an elaborate transactional dependency based service control logic. So, that's a really uh, wordy way of saying it handles dependencies. Um, and transactions, which are a very logical way, and um, it's really different from Sys5 in it, and how they handle um, dependencies. Because 
sometimes during services when might the intercept might not require intensity um, because they might have forgotten the intercept because they're like 110 lines long for LSD they might have forgotten the intensity uh, for system D you just put a target and then system D goes through and it figures out in a uh, magical way that a dependency is needed because the target's being wanted and so it handles it by itself. And that's how you can free desktop, free desktop if you want to go through that. It has some great information on system D as well. So one of the main developers, and this picture I did get with uh, permission, I went to hire to make sure it was Photoshop, but as we all know, that doesn't look Photoshop to me. And um, so he's one of the main developers. He's the author developer for Pulse Audio. And I'm sure a lot of people probably don't like Pulse that much. Uh, I mean, times. Yeah. Well, see, his reason was that Pulse was because of drivers. Sisney doesn't have drivers. But people, and their reason why not to adopt Sisney is they Pulse Audio. And they're apples and oranges. And that's actually the only reason why most people don't like Sisney. Of the winners. But there's also another developer, K. Siebert. He's the guy who gave us UDEV and Gummy Boots. And uh, Gummy Boots is the USB uh, version that allows us to do the uh, system. Instead of using Grub, we use BIOS. And often he uses USB now. And so he's also the developer, but people forget about him because they like UDEV. Most people don't like Pulse. And, um, a little more basic information is enabled by default in these primary distributions. I'm sure there's many derivatives that um, use it too. As you know, there's hundreds and thousands of Linux distributions, and it would be impossible to list everyone that uses system D or that's out the Linux distribution. So, uh, Shaco is the one right here. That cool thing, Open Studios, uh, Arch Linux Arm. And then Arch Linux itself, Magia, which is a derivative of Arch, so is Chakra. And then Mandriva, and then Fedora, of course. And actually, this is being tested and implemented on Fedora systems. So that's where uh, most of the testing goes. They, there's rumors it might come in Red Hat 8. Red Hat has to either conform nor, nor deny it. So we might see it, and that would mean that CentOS would also um, adopt. Uh, system D, because that's usually what CentOS does, it follows Red Hat. Can you say that in Ubuntu? Um, actually, the Ubuntu project is Upstart, and they really, as the Ubuntu project, they, want, they don't want to get rid of it, kind of like Unity. Most people who don't like it, they don't need to keep it, just because they put a lot of money into it. So, but Debian is actually wider on the next slide. Question? Was it uh, this is Chakra Linux. The question was, which one is this one right here, Louis? This is Chakra Linux, the derivative of Arch. And, um... Yeah, C-H-A-K-R-A. Okay, thank you. Follows a really different design model, but that's, um, kind of, that's some esoteric information. So, um, about Debian, actually. Um, they have an alternative in uh, Gentoo and Debian. Debian does not officially support system D. You may have some problems with uh, Debian system running system D because they're targeted towards uh, Sysbox init or upstart, which you can enable back and forth. And Gentoo is, they only did it because it's cutting edge. They really do not like system D that much because uh, they don't like that EDEV was merged in. So they actually port EDEV and created EDEV. So you know Gen 2 developers, great guys sometimes. It's, did I mention that it's enabled in Python? That's the Linux Foundation's mobile operating system. So system D is in all our bases. Can't get away from it. You can use the phone with Python and it has system D to boot through and handle all the services. Uh, it will not come for Android because system D targets mainly a different user audience. And Android targets a Another uh, user lens. Now, if we ask one of your that, and that's, a, that's his explanation. And plus, he doesn't um, think it will really matter. Well, anyway, there's um, 
Again, you should have finer work. There's a lot of duty differences in Cincinnati and Cisco in it and Upstart. So um, I want you guys to think of a, uh, of a highlight. Like most people can meet to work on a busy highlight. Anybody? So I think most people. So imagine that that highlight uh, was this one lane, and you had to wait for that um, blue car up front of you to take a left turn so you can go straight. How much fun would that be? Wouldn't it be that much fun? Because you have a bunch of cars going once. And you shouldn't depend on that car in front of you to make a left turn so you can keep going. But that's what SysPods in it does. Um, so for here is for uh, SysPod starts first, and Bilo starts, and then Abahi starts, and Bluetooth starts. Now Abahi and Bluetooth do not depend on each other. They can, um, they can um, actually you can just have Bluetooth start. So it's really a outdated method of starting services. Questions? Where's, oh, sorry. And so upstart is we take the same model and then we have it come into a two lane room. And so now we kind of get a little bit more um, speed. So it's not that much speed because there's a touch point. What happens if D-Bus fails? No, then a body and Bluetooth can't start up. And so you have a traffic ban. And so that's what um, Upstart uses. Now the next one is System D. And what it does is that instead of making the roads, instead of making the cars, it makes the roads first for every service and then bam, it starts. And it uses this thing called track activation, which is in the next slide. So instead of making the cars um, start up, it just opens up as many that are, that are needed and there's no dependency on it. So, going on to project. Huh? How about dependencies? Like, um, for example, I might have five USB ether adapters, and I have to make sure that USB is up before I attempt to start the ether. So, the question to understand is that you have these Ethernet devices on your uh, computer, and you want to um, be starting, you want to make sure that. Uh, your Ethernet's up, or your uh, network manager's up, and then you can um, do on with services that require the network. Kind of the same thing? Well, just ask how, how that scenario would work, you know, because I would prefer USB services be running before um, network is well, initiated. Well, this is where socket activation comes in. So, and also the service calls. The service calls will list what is required after and what is required before. And um, it actually will go through, if it does have a service call, it's a new service call, it goes through and take an LSD in it script or a RTD script and it will parse it and it will just um, take the same dependency. And so it will wait, if a service requires Ethernet first, it will wait for Ethernet to come up and then it will um, start that service up because the socket that that service is requiring before the Ethernet is already active. So all it takes is for the socket to say, the dependency of the net, white me up, beam me up, Scotty, and then bam, just like that. Uh, so if I go to service waiting for Ether, and then get, if I if it knew that there were Ethers that were on USB, it could have those wait on USB. Yeah, it, what it does is take this uh, thing called socket activation, that AOC in socket, and it activates the socket first, and then the service, um, comes through and then it says, I need a socket and then your service is up. So it actually doesn't wait for another service to um, uh, start, just activates the socket. And then it waits for the dependency to be met. If that makes any sense. Questions? Yes. Um, it replaces it because INET, or SysPod INET, was using INET D sockets. Uh, system E's AF units, sockets. Yeah, on these sockets, which were um, how unit scripts were starting their services on these sockets. And on the actually required the service started first, if I'm correct. Alright, so I'm not correct. Ah, so this is. Yeah, it would. It would be replaced. Yeah, I 
as a service cell, uh, system D has a built-in journal function that uh, replaces syslog. And uh, it will actually tell you um, the service, it will bind the service, and it will say um, this failed because this failed, and it will give you um, a real uh, concise and really verbal uh, a, a result, which is actually really nice because sometimes in syslog, a service might not have as much metadata as we want, and you might not know why it failed. The journal, journal, um, journal D actually takes that and takes it to the next level, and so you can actually um, under audit the service. So I could go over that. Any more questions? So on the activation, this is the black magic behind system D. Um, so it's actually not new. This is where launch D comes into play. So Apple had this problem of Unix systems are taking kind of a lot of boot. They really didn't like it because they wanted to have nice systems that they can say, ha, Windows, you can't do it like we can. So they came up with launch D. They uh, used uh, AO6 unit socket to do this realization. So um, Syslog in it did not take that same approach. They kind of said, eh, not now, we'll do it all serial. And Upstart says, well, we'll do partial serial, then we'll do the rest parallel. And System E goes, well, why not just make it all parallel? And so that actually allows your simultaneous start of the services. So Diva starts up, Syslog starts up, Bluetooth starts up, and Avahi starts up, independent of each other. And any other services, uh, your DVM wants to start up after it's met its target. And so uh, there's no need to configure dependencies explicitly. And you just tell what the target is, and the system D understands to a point that it um, knows the service is going to be ran. And then, um, if a service dies, the socket stays down. This is really cool. So let's say I have a MPD socket, an uh, MPD service cell, and I wanted to uh, play music. So I start it up, and the socket activates, the service commits to the socket, and I'm starting to play music. And for whatever reason, a check fault happens, the service just stops, it doesn't want my music toy, but I'm convinced that um, MP player, M player does not like my music torture sometimes because it will just stop. But a socket stays around. So when I call the service again and say, hey, restart, it catches that socket and there's no need to uh, make the socket activate again. So the socket stays around. So if D-Bus um, fails on you, the D-Bus socket stays there. So then it connects again to the D-Bus socket after you restart it. Which is really cool. Because in, um, in other systems, you might not it's kind of iffy unless it will uh, reconnect. And sometimes the service will fade away and your socket goes too. And you don't know what to do. So um, you can also upgrade and restart a service on demand. So um, I upgraded recently my CNC service on my uh, Raspberry Pi, which runs Arch. And um, I actually did not have to um, kill the service and then upgrade it. All I had to do was upgrade and then I restarted it and bam. It was nothing I really had to do. It was really, really nice because I really didn't want to um, uh, restart it sometime. And you can also replace the service at runtime. So let's say um, I have, I use LXDN for my display manager. Let's say I want to use a GDN. I can say um, stop LXDN and start GDN and then it will take me back to GDN prompt and I can start it from there. And it's on demand, you don't have to uh, shut down your computer and restart to get GDM again. You can? Yeah. I always had that, always had that problem, because it never always worked. Like every day on my Xbox Media Center, I actually restart the display manager. Exactly what I was just And in my experience, in my experience, who's talking about you can actually on a minute, in my experience, it's never really played nicely with me. It could just be my uh, RTBN scripts that are not written properly, which I haven't known to do, which is all it's just me service calls because it's 10, it can be 10 lines at max, it can be 5 lines at min. So, yeah. Um, so, services, talking about sockets. 
kind of follows. They must have been in public system D in order to be ran. And then um, they can be started on demand. They can start a service on demand because all they'll do is add to the socket and they'll connect to the socket. And so you don't have to, um, uh, you don't have to tell it explicitly to start because once the program starts and requires a service, it then calls the socket and the service starts. And it's controlled by secrets, so there's a lot of BSC cannot run it because secrets are inherent in the Linux kernel. And what secrets does is that instead of treating it as a service, it treats it as a group. And so you can have a service that likes a port, and sometimes those ports a lot and it can get away from system D. But in system D, because it's a group, it can port five times and still under system D's watch live. And can still be audited by system D. So it's really nice. And you can get away from dangerous that port continuously to try to escape out. And uh, you can also audit um, start services. Towards the end, I'll show you how you can do that. So it's a nice cool um, demo. Some uh, interesting commands. So on um, logging D. So console kit got replaced by logging D in most systems that run system D. You can still enable it, but most the preferred way is by logging D. The logging D is a native uh, system D thing. It does multi seat management. So a seat, as you know, it's all your hardware components, all the physical devices, your screen, your printer, your USB. Etc. And so you can have multiple seats on a server. Like a, you can have multiple seats on a server, and everybody can um, be running um, off of that server with multiple seats. Yes, those work for multiple uh, monitors and um, stuff on the same machine. And so you have to use session switch management. So when you switch a session, um, this is not really that much new, but once you switch a session, system D will under will not uh, go, where did you go? Because it's actually handling the uh, session by itself. That's a really cool feature. So I can log out right now, which I won't, because chances are I'll mess when you go from presentation. And I can switch sessions to another one manager and Everything that was running in that session will carry over to my session. Nothing will get lost when it's closed. And also, SSH differs from a remote login. So, um, if the internet was talking right now, I'll be able to show you SSH into a machine and put a power off. Uh, I'll ask them to syndicate, then I'll syndicate, and then it will say you are denied access because you don't have a seat. Which is kind of which is kind of funny because you're not sitting in front of the machine. Anyway, that's the advantage. So as a, so um, anything that requires um, a seat cannot be run on S, on, on a remote <coughs> But if I was to tell my machine right now to uh, power off, it would power off immediately. And that's just the difference. And it's actually really nice because you can prevent users. Like me, when I play jokes with my friends, you don't want your SSH machine and tell them to power off and then tell them that your server's down. Not that I would do that a lot, but it is a really fun joke to play. <laughs> well, yeah, if you do like murder, I just call them up and say, hey man, your machine's down. I don't know what happened. And of course, they'll go through the logs and find out that I did it. And repercussions usually have. So um, the journal which I believe someone was talking about, um, wanting to see if a service fails. So the journal actually logs all the services, logs everything that's happening for each uh, um, service, and also drives made it at it. So you can actually see that um, what's the dark services running is a network manager for one, and yeah, so you don't have to guess what the service is. And then, um, so, so in order for a um, service to write to system D, it must be started with system D. Now you can do a full echo command where you can uh, pipe a echo into the system D journal, but um, most people don't generally know how to do that, and most people really don't care because it's just a journal, and there's no really point in reading it. That's 
says, unless you have a troubleshooting of problem. Which is actually the only reason why I read the journal is when something goes wrong. Because I trust the machine to run, which could be a fault of mine, but I'm just not that uh, uh, uh -huh, I have to replace the syslog. Because syslog is, at the time, would not give um, that much cohesive output of what the service is doing. And so the system B kind of takes that and then get more metadata. So you have to understand what's happening. So if it replaces a syslog, is there a uh, network syslog kind of replacement? General uh, CPL handles it too. So this is on network or IP issue? Yes. So it replaces syslog. It handles everything that syslog did and it handles more. So you just have one stop shop, which is another reason I'm like Google like system D, because it's kind of do too much. At, um, one time, which is actually if your system administrator is going on, so you don't have to go hopping around logs and figuring out what the service is doing. The system D tells you what it's doing. Or oh, general system. Yeah, the log message is still there, right? Um, there is actually a symlink for um, syslog. So if you do syslog, it will symlink to general CPL on most systems, unless the developer has enabled that. Um, I know on Fedora. Um, when I did a virtual machine, I did syslog, it uh, went to general CPL. Oh, this is a nice cool assembly. Um, so this, this last part is talking about users, as in a user who is a not part of the system general group. They can um, not write to log. Um, they can only read them if given access. So if you're part of the uh, system D journal group, you can see uh, detailed uh, information about the um, uh, services that it's being run, but if for certain options, you'll system D says, I'm sorry, you're not part of the group, paint what you see this. And so you just add yourself to the group, uh, log out, log back in, and you can see what that service is doing. Or you can see your own CPL and go through the long list of um, all the entries, which is kind of cumbersome, like you just tell system D, I just want to audit this service, and it will do it. So, um, so here's some useful commands. So this is how you actually enable a service, or disable. So actually I can say um, systems, uh, let's make it group. Should be on the mm -hmm. That any bigger? Huh? Yeah, you score it. Okay, and um, well, that's why API graphic cards for pod tree drivers are not that fun. But anyway, so um.
So if, if there's any way you should get any back to um, you can actually, because uh, they use Git and they also use bug tracker, and you can actually go on your system D and you can submit a bug, and they'll usually um, they get to the bug in at least a day or two. So much of command, you know. Yeah. I need it run local space five. Would be nice. Right. Or three. Three is better. Three is be better. But um, then there's this. There are some other commands like the journal. And they'll, they'll be able to go online and uh, stuff. Yeah. There's, there's some cool journal stuff. You can actually have a journal audit a uh, service. And there's also, you can have a CD talk. So it'll take the control group and it'll show you how much CPU power the service is running, uh, what control group it is, um, how much physical disk space is it using. And um, then you can also uh, tell it to give you a hierarchy. Of um, the control group, and I'll list through them all and say LSDM is part of this control group, uh, GDM is part of this control group, WIS is part of this control group, Net Control is part of this control group, and this goes through this huge hierarchy. And it's really nice if, if you're into that. And then you can also do a system to analyze, and what analyze will do is that um, it will analyze the system, and if you pass a certain option, you can tell it to generate a uh, boot um, information when it starts up. So it'll tell you uh, the kernel is this long to run, and it'll show you graphically, and you can go through and you can see how long it takes your system to run up. So when you're going through the troubleshooting and figuring out what service is not working like it should, you can look at it, and then you can ask a friend who has a uh, factory system and has the exact same services, and you can go through and um, figure out why it's not running like it should. And there's a multitude of problems that cannot run like it should. But um, that's one way to do it. You can also tell it, which is really nice because you can show your friends my system's faster than yours. Which most, most people in IRC like to do. They like to one up somebody else. And that's what we do. We actually had one conversation where 10 uh, outputs were um, read out and posted on an image, and we saw who was the fastest. And the person that won. Got off for a day and then they kicked it away. <laughs> but you know, it was, it was, it was kind of fun because I could actually see it without having to go through the system and have this um, in curses with this like a cool PNG. And it's really cool to want to somebody else. And then um, there's also, you can also tell it to um, what a system will status and it will tell you the status of the system. All of it, and we'll just keep going through it all the way through. Or you can just tell the system uh, CCL status uh, what's it. You know, tell you what what's it's doing, what control group it's a part of, uh, what's it needed before it, what's needed after it. And I'll just show you all this information. And you don't really have to go on this listed web page to read it. You can just have it in your terminal, which is really nice when your internet connection's out. Because then you can just see the control group. And it's just really great on uh, troubleshooting uh, information. Or you can just go through it all and say, I want the status of the system. And I'll go through and tell you every service in this cap page uh, as it goes down. So, yeah, after that hardware fail, uh, any questions? Uh huh. Which is why it's always so it continues to find. <laughs> um, actually, with the repository drivers, I always that seems to also get the same problem. Um, because I'm using legacy, because I'm a student, and I don't really want to go buy any laptops, because I'm cheap. <laughs> and. And the only reason I have a repository driver is for Steam. So I don't know, it's very Coming back up. Yes. So, 
So that's what we need a third scholar to put for us. Because do I answer it? Because if you have to be in the system, you identify the system, you will actually put a mark on that name of the place. This is your LSD all capitals, you can identify it. Yeah. And what system is it in that? So what you want to do is you want to uh, submit a bug to your package manager and say, please support system D. And hopefully they'll, they'll get the message and more packages will start to adopt. You know, have first off, this is really not that much work. So at least 10 lines for a really complicated one. And you know, LSD and Inscript are always 110 lines or more. And some of them can go a little less, but it's still 10 lines compared to 110. How much, um, how much time does it take to write it? Because I can write a 10 line piece of uh, code in like uh, 30 minutes. It might be a little work. I don't know yet. <laughs> but anyway, that's pretty much it. Just uh, tell your um, packager and the uh, people up screen, please support System D. Um, if you do not have System D, I encourage you to go to like Fedora or Arc or somebody else who has it. Um, if you don't want to have system D, then you can go into the RC channels and plain bake all the system D loaders if you wanted to. Which is a lot of a lot of a lot of people love to do. Especially people who do not use Arch, they'll come into our channels and they'll start a system D argument. Not that I'm advocating it, but it would be funny to watch. It, it is kind of worth it. Uh, so one of the things I'm seeing now that uh, I mean, it's pretty easy to do is not so hard is to swap things B in, in conjunction with uh, journal uh, detail and or journal D. And the reason I'm doing that is because I don't know how to make journal D uh, output to regular plain text files. It's just you know, since this is a database, you can only use access to journal detail, whereas syslog and D still dumps plain text files like is there a way to make journal D dump to plain text in the way that syslog is doing now? Because I'd rather not have to do this on the server. Sure, you could type it out to a text file. Uh, take the, um, have it run the output and then type it that way. I haven't really had come across this problem because I really don't read logs until something goes wrong, which is probably a really bad habit to have. But Another view on that is, is there a way to have Journal CTL spew everything. Yes, you just, you just run journal CTL and it will cascade everything that's happening. Okay, then you just do right here to file name. Yeah, just so like you just pop it out and then you're done. Because it will take everything. But usually when you're troubleshooting, you don't want everything, you want something specific. And you can also do type that specific to a pet file. And it should be okay. If not, you can complain the winner and say that I sent you. And um, yeah, just complain to him. Uh, his IRC name is winner, by the way, it's really easy. Just go on system D, say that I sent you. And um, hopefully he might remember me. If he doesn't, he will, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's like at least 20 of us in here. Yeah. So, so to go with some um, aggravate, no, not aggravate, but um, you know, just have some fun. And um, actually, the uh, System D IRC channel is really great. There's a lot of developers in there, and they'll help you out. <coughs> Questions? So we're going to take the manuscript um, on the other system. So is it sitting in one day or in the or is it kind of the same? Um, it's just, the thing about manuscript is that it's usually um, this uh, distro specific. Um, or system D service files are not distro specific. You can take a Fedora service file that's only written for you and you can put it on your art system and it'll run the same thing. But uh, in the scripts are sometimes, uh, they have some black magic in from the uh, packager uh, from just or disk distro that might not honor it because it might not understand the, um, what's going on. It should honor it, but it depends on how the person who wrote it wrote it and how much black magic they put into it. Because system D is just a computer application, it does not understand everything that's going on, um, and doesn't catch everything. But
But you can always just write a service file for it, and you're done. Just take like an hour, research the problem, and understand what's happening, and you have a 10 line service file, and you can show it to your friends that they can use it too, and you can send it out there to the upstream packagers and say, hey, you should adopt this. You don't have to do any work, because I did it for you. And then, you know, developers are lazy. I, I learned that. As, as I develop code, I'm, I'm lazy. They used to go for the easiest way out. And so usually, when I submitted a uh, service file to one of the upstream projects, they said, oh, we can go, it'll take too much time. And I was like, all it is is just one commit. You don't have to do anything else. But uh, that's, that's another topic. Question? I was just thinking about that problem we had before. But even if we cared, if we did care to a file, it wouldn't keep doing it. Is there a way to have general control do everything and not terminate? Um, um, actually, it. it will not terminate until you hit the key button that I have found. Oh, okay. So you can so the key and then yeah. it and spawn the task, and there you go. Yeah, that's, that's what I've found. Um, I haven't really tested that much about any services, but it should work. That's how it's supposed to be. Supposed to keep a, a real time update. And the great thing about journal CTL versus syslogs, as I said before, is you get your metadata. You can't stress that enough. Because metadata is really nice. Just imagine if you had um, a music library and you had no metadata. And so you had to write down everything that it does on paper and then go back and figure it out. And if you lost that paper, how much fun that would be. And so uh, journal CTLG is the same idea and just takes the uh, aggravation out of uh, system administrating because you know what exactly what the service is doing in a small description of it. Question? Or Yeah, that's what you mean. Um, actually, if you have a system D uh, system, you shouldn't be using Tron. You can actually use system D to take over the uh, 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 uses of Tron that I have found. I've, I've heard it from upstream. I don't know if it's going to be a new or two with it, but that's what you're planning to do. When are you told me? It is huge, but, um... Because if anybody's looking for, like, websites to be in the future, we're going to try to cut those off and do yeah. it. We can go watch it and try and actually explain it. And the winner's a lot better for Center because he paces back and forth. It kind of makes me want to watch. Because he's the only guy who pays from back and forth, and that's just how he is. Not as a bad thing. It makes me want to sit through an hour-long discussion on software and listen to somebody go back and forth. And there's some people who will just sit there and talk, like me, and probably bore people to death. Um, yeah, if you want to replace Tron, I want to start talking about that a little earlier. The developer might not care, but since that's in here, whoa, 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 you got my attention. You can take Tron away, it's a big deal. Well, what, what, are, what are, I think they're going for is that the services can um, have a timer, and so like that, and some other um, intricate pieces of system be. So they kind of want to, put a centralized system administration into one program, which is another reason why most people don't like it, because it breaks the unit philosophy. Because think about it, we have, yeah, it does, because we have journal, we have, um, we have Dexel, comes into system D as native, and uh, most, um, if you start up ours, you have that, uh, Nextel come in for the newest releases, and then you have um, your uh, Analyze, Another program you run in, and it's so many different programs that should all be separate. But System D says, let's just centralize it all. And most people don't like that. I can like it because I'm not that big on the uh, intricacies. And I really kind of don't like system administering that much because I only had to administer my system. And most people in my family do not know how to use Linux. So I'm kind of I can keep a Linux system running in the this is from the house and no one touch it. Because no one understands what's happening. Especially when you run an own app, because people don't know how to put windows easily or spawn a web browser. So 
But yeah, just remember, he, it's, there's um, use powers and use a lot. And that's usually how you get away from uh, people messengers. You know, it's been an admonition to me about central, I mean, centralization is kind of cool, but it bothers me a little bit. It's the way things were, you'd be like, oh, log detail, and we don't have logs anymore, we've got to fix it. Oh, chrome detail, oh, tasks are running, we've got to fix it. Now it's like, oh, system detail, we have no tasks, we have no chrome, we have no services. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just removed it. Well, <laughs> I have been assured about Hunter. And uh, I'm sure he was knocking on one of what he said. The system needs to not fail. Yeah, and it probably won't. No fail. software should have failed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> so I'm at, everything fails. Yeah, everything fails. At some point or everything not. Everything fails. So if you remember that, he said it shouldn't fail. There's a high possibility that it won't. <laughs> but as you know, computers will sometimes have a monitor on them. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I program AI, so sometimes. No, um, they don't. Worry. They still don't have a monitor. Yeah, well, I don't know if they may probably would. Kernel test system D is kind of reassuring, and so when it knows they have a certain problem, it actually is able to restart it all the yeah. time. So you're, it would be very, very difficult, not that much more possible, but it would be really difficult for system D to have to fail one of those systems. But there are all sorts of failures that can happen that system D will run into many times triggered by other pieces of software when you boot your system. But it's highly unlikely that your system is going to fail at some point while it's running, you know, just random. And the chances of it not the chances of it not going to greatly increase that it doesn't have drivers, it doesn't use drivers at all. And you know drivers can sometimes be the tipping point. That's why Pulse Audio was had a really bad reputation when it started up. Because all of the distributions adopted it and then their drivers weren't there just yet. And so you're using Pulse Audio, and the drivers weren't there. People have heard complaining to Leonard about it. And that's also the only, one of the main reasons why people don't like System D, just because of Pulse. Oh, yeah. So if you guys get a Python phone, you can use combine. Huh? I was going to say Google also doesn't like this, but they made a kernel S. Yeah. And it's in Python too. So if you get a Python phone, you can bind him to get your phone to boot. Or you can find the people who package the services. So it's going to one winner for everything. Because apparently everybody else does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that isn't a great idea. This playing Alan. If there's any Arch Linux guys in there, you would probably use this. Just playing Alan. He's the main developer. He's the one who uses these break systems for Arch. So just playing him. Because everybody else does. Um, yeah, any other questions? Any other comments? So, you uh, you talk about this mythical 10 line service file. Uh -huh. And in my experience, software packaged from packages that get an init file from, from a vendor has a 100 line init file. Let's take into account, for instance, the JBall startup for Red Hat. Right. That thing is ridiculous, and you have a table. So, how um, does it require, I, I'm, not, I'm not very familiar with the intricacies of system D, does it require that the application be built properly to start with system D? Because it, it seems unlikely that you're able to bake several hundred lines of script into a 10-line server file like that. Hmm. How, many, how many of those lines are boilerplate? Yeah, I don't the slightest idea because it's, for, it's, it's, it's a thing that you have to get from them. When you bake it, when you're, when you're talking about the idea of a, of a system init file, um, depending on how good you are at writing software, there should be a section that says start and start your process and a section that says stop and stop your process. But that's not, that is just not my experience with other people's software. Is that hundreds and hundreds of lines prior to that, there was the detection of whether what, uh, it's a lot of it is uh, obviously art, art, uh, architecture based, which system you're running on, et cetera, et cetera. But is it, is it likely that in the case you have a, an extensive uh, init file, that it's going to be easy to digest to a system, uh, a system D system file. Anybody? Please. There's a special case with certain instances like that where you have a very convoluted setup, or you need a set of detection routines to happen prior to service. There is uh, pre-up and, 
and post op command. So you can set up those regions in whatever your shell script is, and it will execute that piece and then proceed on to the actual starting up of the service. So we just put the document under yeah. those circumstances? Yeah. We have a different like a different system for that. Shell. Okay. In the shell. And then set that as a pre or a post up. And then you can, of course, do the same thing for setting the environment file. So you can have something that has a specific environment set that's based off of a post up and pre up. Okay. Yeah. And you can do the same thing on the down as well. Well, I've heard Campbell VDN in uh, the industry for a pretty long minute. It's, it's a really small service box. So this data is on, um, all you have to do is just post up in your pre up. So what you want before and what you want after. And then if it requires an edit service that you had to write, just tell it you want before or after. And system B will go through the parts of service file and understand that you need A before you need B. And it'll run A. And, and, if, and if A needs something else, like uh, system service 2, it'll call service 2 like that. And it just goes through the uh, logic. It's really nice. It makes writing uh, your service all pretty easy. Unless, of course, you're like me, and apparently when you link S in to something else, close scripts, that's easily run. But uh, access could be. I mean, kind of take a dirty shortcut, which usually happens. Yes. Oh. Any other questions? Any other comments? There's one more thing that that uh, is the same slide page. Uh, it's a little interesting. Just to me, is that probably the best documented uh, subsystem. There's actually a PDF version of that in the, um, in the store community, I believe, took it, got took out a blog, and uh, made it into a PDF. You can go up there and get it. And you can um, have a PDF on your phone or something, and or on your computer, and you can read it without having to go to the internet. So if you're offline and you're trying to do some administration, you can go through and tell you all that. And a winner has some really great blogs on it, too. Um, at um, a, a pointer, you can just Google search it, and it usually comes up. The free desktop.org sites, amazing documentation for it. The man pages are, uh, Art Gwinnett's uh, wiki page, which is most, I've heard a lot of people say when they uh, research a service or something, it's usually one of the first or second or third uh, results in Google. So you can easily go there and it'll give you some uh, more information. Or you can try and see. I mean, hopefully not more consistent. Any other comments, questions? We want to explain why SysAuto doesn't rock and why SysMD does not. So yeah, pretty much it. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes.
The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments.
you have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center, is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago. Uh, and, you know, it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the CloudStack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. <laughs>